Hi, this is Santo from VintageComputer.ca. Today we're going to be taking a look at the NABU floppy disk and controller card. We're going to be taking a look at some new things that are working and give you a full update. Stay tuned! So from the last time, we took a look at the uh, a demo of the RetroNet software that DJ has with uh, his uh, network adapter and the software that he's got built around that. And we were able to go and use the drive there, but I was not able to boot from it. So uh, today I got a set of disks, two disks from Leo Binkowski. And uh, these were CPM disks. One of them was a, an end user disk, which uh, provided basically CPM version 3 and all of the files that uh, you would normally use in the operating system. And there was a second disk that was a developer disk. And it basically had uh, a couple of different versions of uh, the CPM 3.sys, which were for various configurations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to boot up uh, with the floppy disk by pressing 2 and go. And you can see that there pops up CPM. Unfortunately, this green color is not exactly great for camera. But uh, there you can see it boot up. Now, I have a right protect tab on this disk. I want to make sure I save this disk. However, this is not Leo's disk, so this is actually a copy. But uh, I still put a right protect tab on there anyway. So uh, essentially, what I'm able to do now is do whatever people do in the CPM. So I'm going to do a quick uh, DIR command, and what you notice here is that there's actually partial file names on this side. And so one of the partial file names, as an example, is BAC, but that's uh, backup.com. And you don't see it. So I, I believe this, even though the NABU is 40 columns, I think the CPM is actually 80 columns because you're not seeing all of, the, all of the files. So if I do a DIR on backup.com, Okay, you actually see that it's there, and there's a number of files on here that are not visible on this directory, but it's just off to the side, I believe, and it's, it's out of sight. But uh, the main one here is CopySys, and CopySys allows you to basically make system disks. So now that we have this copy of the uh, NABU uh, CPM3, we can make additional copies, and unfortunately, I've tried uh, multiple ways to be able to archive NABU disks, and uh, I haven't been successful until I went to the Cryoflux. So the first thing I did was I used image disk off of a PC that is set up for uh, archiving that I use for a number of systems. For whatever reason, the particular format used for the NABU is very particular. So uh, I actually used Applesauce, and Applesauce has uh, an IMD format that it will uh, read from and write to. That would not work either. Um, I was able to uh, flux image with Applesauce, but uh, unfortunately I, you can't write with that yet, so uh, I was not able to uh, make a copy that way. However, with the Cryoflux, I was able to do that. So the Cryoflux is a really small device, which is right here. And basically, that uh, allows you to hook up this floppy drive and uh, hook it up to USB to the PC and flux image the, uh, the floppy that's in the, in the drive. Now, I actually went through three different floppy drives, so it's not uh, it's very particular about the format. It's, I believe it's very particular about the RPMs, uh, specifics around the characteristics of the, of the reading. Uh, so that was important that I finally found a drive that worked. But at least we now have disk images um, so that we can move forward with 
trying to image it in other ways so that it's more accessible or easily accessible to others. I know a lot of people don't have cryofluxes, so uh, that's uh, a bit of an issue, but at least the discs are archived, they're on my website, and um, uh, they're available there for anybody who wants to try to do conversions or look at them more deeply and so on. Now, the other thing that's on my website just recently, yesterday Leo Binkowski also sent me firmware from all of his uh, NABU PCs, and there, there are five different versions. And in fact, the version that I'm running on this NABU PC is version 29, which was not the original one I had. That allowed me to run the floppy disk drive and uh, RetroNet through the network adapter at the same time. Prior to this, I was not able to do that. So that was important also. So things are starting to come together. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the floppy drive controller project, the Reef Production. Um, I'm the, I had mentioned in the last update that there was a uh, set of boards coming my way. They're still on their way. Um, I'll be putting that together and testing to make sure everything works. I have the disk to test it. I have the uh, the uh, hardware and everything. So uh, I'll be able to make sure that that works. And then once we confirm that it works or if there needs to be another revision and so on, we'll uh, figure out uh, how to get that uh, out there to the community. So that's the other thing. Now I'm going to do a quick DIR on drive B. And this is a, a fun little update in that uh, if I wanted to right now, I could run Zork off of CPM. So uh, something that uh, a game that a lot of people uh, are interested in, but there is a version of Zork on the NABU PC through RetroNet. And I'm going to show you how to uh, access that now. So this data disk is required. Um, the other thing, and I'm just going to restart this, I have to physically power it off and power it back on. Otherwise, um, if I don't, it will keep asking me to boot from the floppy disk. Now that uh, it goes back in, it gives me the option again. So now I'm going to boot from cable. So the RetroNet software has uh, some software that is sort of hidden in the shortcuts. You can access them through the shortcuts, but you cannot access them through the menus. And uh, that's probably the way developers actually tested things out to make sure that they worked and so on. But uh, this is the main opening screen. Now, unfortunately, you need a floppy drive to run Zork because it gets the Zork1.dat file off of the A drive. Now, the way Zork should work, uh, first of all, I'm going to go to the shortcut. I'm going to type in Zork and go. And what this does is it starts to load up Zork1. Now, the way Zork is supposed to work is when you run it the first time, it will actually write the Zork1.dat file to the floppy drive. That is currently not working because I've actually tried this and uh, with a blank floppy, it, you can't get Zork to run. So what I have on here is the CPM version of Zork, the full thing, it's two files, Zork1.com and Zork1.dat. And that's the dat file that uh, it will it attempts to write, but I guess right now it's not fully there. However, because I have that on, I can actually run it. So you'll see it load, loads up. And uh, there it is. So I can, you, you'll actually find that there are a few different uh, pieces of software that are available through the shortcuts. I don't know what they all are. I haven't done a whole lot of exploring. I've been focusing on the floppy drive. But uh, I know that DJ uh, had asked me if I got Zork to run. I knew that it was there, but uh, at my first pass, I couldn't get it to run because I didn't have the, the data on the floppy drive. 
once I got that, uh, I was able to make it run. So that is basically the full update. Thank you again for uh, listening and watching. If you have any questions, please leave them in comments. And uh, again, thank you again, and take care. Bye now.